Welcome to AP Chemistry at Hanadega High School. I'm Brian Brown, and today we'll be looking at the first three sections of Chapter 7, dealing with periodic properties of elements. Now, Chapter 7 starts with a discussion of the periodic table. Now, elements in the same group on the periodic table generally have similar chemical properties, and this was the driving force behind the creation of the first periodic tables. Now, in pre-AP chemistry, we usually associate Dmitry Mendeleev with this, but really, there were two scientists working independently at the same time that basically came to the same conclusion. They were trying to come up with a better, more useful way to list the elements in a table, and they came up with the same fundamental idea. Elements were grouped by similar properties and increasing in atomic weight. Now, that's not exactly how our modern periodic table is put together, but if you really look, it's very, very, very close to that. So their fundamental table ended up very close to what our final periodic table actually looks like. Now, one of the reasons why it was so useful was because of something that Mendeleev did. Uh, for instance, he predicted the discovery of germanium, which he called acosilicon. It was the element that was um, missing between zinc and arsenic on his periodic table. And rather than try and change his rules, what he said was, well, this element is just an element like a, a card that's missing in a deck of cards. If you arrange it from uh, in the into the four suits and ace through king, you can see whatever cards are missing. Well, he did the same thing. So he had a number of elements that were missing on his periodic table. And based upon their location in the table, he was very accurately able to predict what the properties and atomic weights of these elements would look like. So he was able to describe elements that hadn't been discovered yet. And within a few years of publishing his table, those elements were discovered. So very quickly, scientists realized that there was something to Mendeleev's periodic table. But remember, really, Lothar Meyer and Mendeleev came up with the same general idea. Mendeleev just did a little bit more with it. Now, I mentioned that that's very similar to what our modern periodic table looks like. Well, our modern table really came about after 1913 when Henry Mosley realized that the little inconsistencies that were in Mendeleev's table seemed to disappear if we didn't rearrange it or didn't arrange it by atomic mass, but instead rearranged it by increasing atomic number, which stands for the number of protons. And that gave us our fundamental modern periodic table. Now, in the chapter, you're going to need to know and be able to explain trends in effective nuclear charge, um, which is also called effective nuclear strength, the sizes of atoms and ions, both what the trends are and why, ionization energy, and metallic character. And we'll also probably mention a little bit about electronegativity, which hopefully you'll remember from pre-AP chemistry. But one thing you need to understand with these, don't confuse explaining the trend with describing the trend. So. One of the things you may remember from last year is that atoms get smaller when you go to the right. So you can't say that oxygen is smaller than nitrogen because it's farther to the right. That's not explaining why. It's just explaining it will be smaller. So when I say explain the trend, you need to say something more than it's farther down or it's farther to the right. That's confusing the explanation of the trend with actually describing the trend. Now, first one we're going to look at, and this is critical to many of our ideas, not just this chapter, but beyond, and that's effective nuclear strength. Now, in a many electron atom, electrons are both attracted to the nucleus and repelled by other electrons. So we really have two competing forces on our electrons, the repulsions by the other electrons and the attraction by the nucleus. Now, the nuclear charge that electron experiences depends upon both factors. So we can talk about the strength or the charge of the nucleus as the number of protons, but we really are only then looking at the attraction of the nucleus to the electrons, and we're not accounting for the repulsions of the electrons to each other. Now, effective nuclear charge is the net positive charge experienced by an electron in a many electron um, atom, and it's taking into account both factors. So it's not the same as the charge of the nucleus because of the effect of inner level electrons repelling. And that basically works against the attractive force of the nucleus. So we have two competing forces here when we go to look at effective nuclear charge. Now, the electron is attracted to the nucleus, but repelled by the inner shell electrons that shield or screen it from the full nuclear charge. And you remember this, hopefully, from last year in talking about the shielding effect. Screening, shielding, the exact same thing. And we use the two interchangeably. And what they're really looking at is how the electron repulsions affect the attract attraction of the nucleus. And those core or inner level electrons are really what we're looking at when we're talking about the shielding effect. Now, to calculate 
effective nuclear strength. And we're not going to do the calculations, although I'm going to walk you through it here in a second, but we don't really do these calculations physically. What we need to understand is what they are, how we come about getting those um, numbers, and understanding their trends on the periodic table. So to find effective nuclear strength, which would be Z sub E F F, we would take Z, which is the atomic number, how many protons, and subtract what's called the screening constant. Now, the screening constant is going to be very close to how many core electrons we have. So you count your inner level electrons and subtract them from the number of protons. So you can see off at the left here, I've got an example of that. We're talking about the sodium atom. Sodium has 11 electrons in its nuclear, or a total of 11 um, electrons and protons. So in its nucleus, it's going to have 11 protons. And outside of it, it's going to have 10 core electrons in the 1s and 2s levels. It's 1s, 2s, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. So it has 10 core electrons and one valence electron. So remember, our core electrons are the one that really affect electron-electron repulsion. So if we want to make an estimate of the effect of nuclear strength or charge, we take 11, the number of protons, the atomic number, and subtract the number of core electrons. And we end up with a value of 1 plus. So this is the simple, easy way to make a relative comparison of the different atoms and nucleuses and electrons on the periodic table to each other. So this is our simplistic view here. And remember, you don't really need to be able to do these calculations. Just understand the concepts behind them. Now, because valence electrons also have a probability, remember we're subtracting just the core electrons, but this valence electron is also at some point in time going to be in the middle as well, contributing to our electron or electron repulsion. You need to understand that the actual value of ZF is usually greater than the equation predicts because it would be true that the... Um, core electrons are also going to be in the middle, and when it's in the middle, the, or I should say, let me specifically back up and say this right, the valence electron is going to spend some of its time in the middle, and when it's in the middle, the core electrons aren't effectively shielding it. Therefore, the effective nuclear strength is typically a little bit higher than what we would predict here. You just need to understand that conceptually, not numerically. But it would be true that sometimes valence electrons are in the middle, and when they are, they're not going to be shielded as much. Now, what are the trends in effective nuclear strength? Well, you really only need to worry about one. Effective nuclear strength increases across a period. Now, if you think about it, it makes sense why. As you go across a period, you're adding the number of protons in the nucleus, so the nucleus is getting stronger and stronger and stronger. But going across a period, you're adding valence electrons. And remember, valence electrons aren't as good at shielding. So adding valence electrons does a little to shield or screen the nuclear charge from the valence electron. So across a period, the single most important thing to remember is effective nuclear strength increases. And that's pretty much going to be the cause or the explanation for every single period trend we ever discuss in the chapter. Now, as far as a group trend, effective nuclear strength really isn't relevant. So when we're going down a group, we don't even worry about effective nuclear strength. And that's because that's not important as the other thing that's happening when you're going down a group. When you're going down a group, you're increasing N. And that means you're going to higher and higher energy levels. And the higher the energy level is, the farther you are from away from the nucleus. And remember, distance kills attractive forces through Coulomb's law. So by Coulomb's law, the force of attractions decrease as distance increases. And this is what's important every single time we're talking about a group trend. So you'll notice a common theme. Everything we're supposed to be able to effectively predict and explain. When we're going across, we're going to talk about effective nuclear strength does this. And when we're going down, we're going to say, as N increases, this happens. And it's really a Coulomb's law effect. What's the consequence of being farther from the nucleus? Well, the attractive forces are less. Now, one of the things I've mentioned a few times, I want to make sure I mention it again, is Bohr's atom look like our picture here on the left. All of our energy sublevels were at the same energy. And that's true when we have a hydrogen atom with only one electron. But when we add other electrons, the energy levels, or I should say the sublevels within a level, separate into different discrete energy amounts. In other words, they're no longer degenerate. What's the cause of that? Well, when we had electrons, more than one, we're going to get electron-electron repulsion that didn't exist before. So the reason our sublevels 
spread into different discrete energy amounts when we have more than one electron is because of the electron to electron repulsion. And that's really a related to the concept of effective nuclear strength. So this is a related idea, because remember that was looking at how the strength of the nucleus is affected by our electron-electron repulsions. Now, one common misunderstanding, because this is an idea you should understand, is how come 2s is lower in energy than 2p, which is lower in energy than 2d? Or I should say, if we're on the third energy level, then we can have sps and ds. And how come it's always, the s sublevel is always lower in energy than the p's, which are lower in energy than the d's, which are lower in energy than the f's? Well, this is actually something that's commonly misunderstood by students on the AP test. So many students believe, because they've been told this misconception often, because teachers often confuse this as well, is that the 2s electron is actually closer to the nucleus. So if you look at the average distance from the nucleus, more of the time the 2s electron is closer to the nucleus, so therefore the 2s is lower in energy, because the closer you are to the nucleus, the stronger the nucleus pull you ha has on you, and that's lower potential energy, more stable. Well, if you actually look at our diagrams here, shifted just a little bit to the right of the top of the hill is where our average distance is going to be. Notice in our 2s electron, its average distance is actually farther from the nucleus than in the 2p. So this idea is not valid. So it's a common misconception. The 2s electron actually has a sli slightly higher radial probability. So it's going to be a little bit farther from the nucleus on average. So what's going on? Because we do know that the 2s is lower than the 2p, and the 3s is lower than the 3p. So if it's not because the 2s electron is close to the nucleus, what's going on? Well, it really deals with that little hill you see right there. The 2s electron actually penetrates and spends a significant chunk of time much closer to the nucleus than the 2p electrons do. They don't have that big hump there in the 2p. So it would be true that a significant part of the time that 2s electron has significantly less shielding or screening, and that's going to lower the overall effective nuclear strength. So the greater attraction of the nucleus on those very close electrons is going to mean a much lower over, or I should say a slightly lower overall energy. So it will always be true on any given energy level that the S will always be lower in energy than the P, which will always be lower in energy than the D, then, which will always be lower in level than the F. And this exact idea is really what explains all of those. So it's not that it's closer, it's that it's, it spends a big chunk of time significantly closer. And that lowers the overall screening, which gives you more effective nuclear strength on that electron. So those are ideas related to effective nuclear strength. Now, where do we apply those ideas? Well, one way is when we look at the size of atoms and ions. Now, the bonding atomic radius is defined as one half the distance between covalently bonded nuclei. Now, you got to be careful. Bonding atomic radius and non-bonding atomic radius are two different distances. And the non-bonding radius, the distance from here to here, is always greater because when these atoms attract each other to form a bond, they're actually pulling each other close together. So this distance, the bonding um, atomic radius is actually different than the non-bonding atomic radius. Now, when we're looking at data, we're always looking at one or the other. And as the bonding atomic radius gets smaller, so does the non-bonding atomic radius. Um, so it's just an idea to be careful of. Are they talking about bonding or non-bonding atomic radiuses? Because in some situations, when you're looking at data, that can be confusing. The reality is, no matter which one we're looking at, as you go across from left to right on the periodic table, they're getting smaller. So the general trend is, as you go to the right on the periodic table, the size of the atom is getting smaller. And remember, everything across is going to be due to effective nuclear strength. So as the nucleus is increasing in effective strength, it pulls in those valence electrons into a smaller volume. So the greater Z sub um, EFF is, so our effective nuclear strength, the smaller atom is going to be across. Now remember when we go down, effective nuclear strength is irrelevant. What's important when you go down is N is increasing. And as N increases, remember N is literally the energy level. As N gets bigger, you get farther away from the nucleus. So it falls to reason that because N is increasing when you're down, your atom has to be larger. And remember, this is a common theme. Every across trend will always be due to this. And every downtrend will always be due to that every single time, no matter what we're looking at. Next idea would be ions. Now, 
first thing you need to understand is ions are a little more complicated. There's some extra things that have happened when we form an ion, and that has an effect on what we need to understand about size. So really, when we're looking at the ion size, we're looking at three things. One, the charge of the nucleus, that's important. The number of electrons, because we can get screening and electron repulsions exist when we have electrons, but also the orbitals in which those electrons reside can have an effect on our ion size. So we have three things we think about when we're talking about ion size. Now, before we look at trends in ion size, we need to look at just cations and anions themselves. What's happening when we make them? Well, first, cations are always smaller than the parent atom with which it's made. Now, if you look over here, the ones in pink are looking at a relationship between the cation, which is the pink, to the neutral atom. And you'll notice in every single case, the cation is smaller than the neutral atom. Well, it makes sense if you think about it. To make a cation, we're removing an electron. In fact, we're removing, typically, all of the electrons in our outer valence level. Well, when that happens, we're going to have lower n, which means we are closer to the nucleus. So when we remove an entire shell of electrons, we are going to have a smaller atom. The other thing you need to understand is when we have less electrons, that minimizes our electron-electron repulsion. And remember, those electron-electron repulsion are what fight the strength of the nucleus and allow the electron to expand a little bit. So we have two things here that are true when we make a cation to explain why it. The cation is always smaller than the neutral atom. Now when we look at anions, now we're looking at the blue or purplish section here. Now you'll notice it's the exact opposite. The neutral atom is actually smaller than the anion. Anions are always bigger than the parent atoms they come from. And it makes sense, once again, if you really think about the idea. We've added electrons to make an anion. That's going to increase our electron-electron repulsion with the same strength nucleus. So that means we're going to have a larger region of space those electrons exist in. So electrons are added and the repulsions increase. That's going to make that atom swell. And our total volume of space it occupies when we become an ion is going to be greater. So that's one thing you should understand about cations and anions is their formation. Second thing about cations and anions is you need to understand their trend across and down. Now, we're not comparing cations to anions. We're looking at what do the cations do across and cations do down. And what do the anions do across and the anions do now, down? Because we're, we have to compare apples to apples and not apples to oranges. So ions increase in size as you go down. And remember, everything down is caused by an increase in N. So it would be true that when we go from Li plus to Na plus, we've added a whole valence level. And therefore, we're going to be farther away from the nucleus, a larger atom. And you'll also notice when you go to the right, the ions decrease. Now, this works for cations and anions, but we're not going, we're not comparing cation to anion size. We're just saying all cations when you go to the right get smaller, and all anions when you go to the right get smaller. And that's because when you go to the right, remember we're increasing effective nuclear strength, and that's going to pull in whatever electrons we have into a smaller volume. Now, the last idea is what's known as isoelectronic. And this is an idea that students often struggle with. So make sure you think through this and get it straight in your head. An isoelectronic series is a group of atoms and ions that have the same number of electrons. Now, if you take a look at what's listed up here, we have Na+, we have Mg2+, and we have Al3+, and we have O2-, and we have F-. Now, if you look at where sodium is at on the periodic table, sodium is atomic number 11, so it has 11 protons, which means it has 11 electrons. Well, if we lose one, it has 10 electrons. Magnesium on the periodic table is 12. Well, Mg2 plus means we've lost two electrons. It's got 10 electrons. Al3 plus, aluminum is 13. It's lost three. It's got 10. O2 minus, O has eight. When it picks up two electrons, it's got 10. F minus, F has nine. When it picks up one electron to become F minus, it's got 10. Every one of these substances has the same number of electrons, 10. So they're what we call an isoelectronic series. An isoelectronic is a vocab word you're going to see from time to time related to, idea, uh, to things. So remember, whenever you see isoelectronic series, all it really means is you have a group of things with the same number of electrons. So Na plus is isoelectronic to Mg2 plus. It means iso means same, same number of electrons. And that finishes our first set of notes.